with that going. So another fun example that I didn't yesterday, uh, and that's uh, using buckling for propulsion. So, so far we've only been looking at, I forgot my rulers today. Uh, so far we've only been looking at beams that buckle uniformly, but what happens if you then force a beam into a state of curvature that it is non-uniform? So uh, this is, again, that same guy, D David Bigoni from Trento, um, and they have this interesting experiment where uh, they have serpentine locomotion. So I, I also linked this on the canvas for yesterday. Let's make this full screen. There we go. I also linked this on the canvas for yesterday. Uh, so basically they, they take these non-uniform shapes. Uh, so this is effectively buckling or bending a beam non-uniformly. And then because it's non-uniform, that gradient allows you to create a, a buckling gun, effectively, or projectile. Yeah, so this is, this is spring steel that they're using, which is able to s deform elastically a lot. <laughs> From one screen to the other. Yeah. So I, I thought this was a nice, another fun demonstration of, of instabilities in action. Um, and they relate it to serpentine locomotion. I think, is there another? No. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe my video is just going to freeze on me. Okay, that's fine too. I think there might be another demo example in there, but um, this is, I, I think, another cool illustration of of instabilities in materials and snapping between states. So if you can, uh, so that, that snapping motion, I guess, uh, if, is you all may be familiar with it, uh, with the, the popper toys. So the popper toys, the, these things, where you kind of flip them upside down and then they, and they pop up on the table. It's the exact same principle. So you're using some uh, stored elastic energy in an, in an unstable state that's snapping into a new stable state kind of rapidly and then using that for propulsion. So with these, it's, it's just the same as that uh, jar lid, that uh, snapping between a, an inverted and a, and a dome shape. Uh, in this case, where my video is now entirely frozen, cool, uh, you're using uh, non-uniformly buckled shapes to get that thing to to shoot out. So all, all examples of instabilities and in materials that I thought were kind of fun. So today we're going to talk about how we actually get to that Euler Bernoulli equation. So I'm going to go through first a pin pin example and then the full derivation of how you get that solution for an arbitrary boundary condition, uh, which I don't necessarily expect you to, to use in the end, but I think it's a nice pullback to beam theory uh, because you use the same equation for it. So uh, let's talk about the pinned, pinned, buckled example. So this is our pinned, pinned, buckling. This is that base case that we have for Euler buckling where we have uh, a pin beam so both of these ends can rotate freely uh, and then this pin beam ends up going out into some buckled shape some deflected buckled shape and so now I'm going to try to do, kind of, kind of like we did yesterday with a sum of moments, I'm going to do a similar type of analysis to try to understand what the critical load is to cause this to buckle. So what that, that P critical is for, for this to snap into a new buckled state. And to do that, what I'm going to look at is just the bottom half of this beam. So uh, the bottom half of the buckled thing, it's now facing the opposite way. Um, but so here at the bottom, I have a reaction force that's equal to P. 
Um, inside of the beam now, I have some axial force and some bending moment. So remember, we're, we're assuming these are beams, so the beam can only take uh, a bending moment or, or I guess an axial compression here. Uh, and this beam is then deflecting by some amount W of X. So I'm gonna draw my coordinate system now. I'm gonna say this is an X and a Z. There's some applied force of X inside the beam and some moment X inside the beam and a reaction P here at the bottom. So what I'm gonna do is that legible? Hopefully not too small. Um, cool. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a sum of all the forces and moments in this system to try to see if I can... Uh, X is along the axis of the beam. Z is lateral. Yeah, I guess... I drew my, my beam buckled out in the opposite direction, but I think that's fine. Um, okay, so now what I want to do is I want to say, in order for this thing not to be moving, the sum of forces in the x direction has to be equal to zero, and the sum of moments around, I'm going to use this point zero here at the bottom, the sum of moments at the base also has to be equal to zero. So now if I were to do a force balance on this thing, in the x direction there's a force going down and a, and a load going up. So this is my uh, load going in the positive direction minus my force going in the opposite direction. And for a sum of moments, I have uh, the P is acting along the axis of that uh, point, so it doesn't contribute my force F is acting at some distance um, f of x, w of x away. Uh, and I'm going to say that's acting, I guess, counterclockwise, which I've also drawn my moment to be acting counterclockwise. So plus some m of x going that way. From our first equation, I can say that my f of x <coughs> is just p. So it's a, it's a constant force axially throughout the beam. Um, at least in this uh, buckled configuration that I have. To figure out this other state now, I, I need to pull on a relationship that we had from beam theory for our bending moment. So if you remember, I can say our, our bending moment is equal to uh, negative EI W double prime of X, which um, we, I don't know if I had actually derived that for you all, but um, this was, from way back uh, in the beginning of the quarter when we were talking about beam theory. So I can plug these two relationships back into this moment equation and say now P W of X minus E I W double prime of X is equal to zero. So now I have a convenient ODE that I can solve. This ODE, the solution to the ODE, is a sine and a cosine term. Awesome. Is this? Ah, cool. Uh, homework threes are graded. I started passing them around. So I pass it out another round. Has everyone packed yet? Or grabbed their homework three? I have it going another loop. Um, oh, uh, side note. There was one homework three that didn't have a name. Somebody typed it up, um, and they had some nice figures that they made for it. If you want to claim it, just come up and talk to me later. Um, cool. So uh, now we have this nice ODE that we can solve. The general solution to this ODE I have is uh, W of X is C1 cosine of, uh, I would have to move this EI over and divide these things out. Uh, but cosine of square root of P over EI X plus C2 sine of square root of P over EI X. And so now this is the general 
buckled shape that I have for my beam. So, so, or this is the general, the general shape that this ODE would describe. So it takes on some sine and cosine combination. And then to figure out what the actual solution is to this, we need to start plugging in boundary conditions to figure out what our end endpoints are. So I know for a pin pin beam, I know my boundary conditions now, W at zero is equal to zero, and my W at L is equal to zero. So now I use boundary conditions. Um, if I plug in W of zero is equal to zero, then I have W of zero is just my C1, because uh, my cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero. So then W, my C1 is just equal to zero. Um, and then if I plug in my W of L, I have, this is now C2 sine square root of P over E I L is equal to zero. Let me make sure this is going right. Yep, cool. So, um, cool. now in solving this, there are two potential solutions. So one I can say is, is my trivial solution, where I just say my C2 is equal to zero. So what that would mean is that's, so if my C2 is equal to zero, my W of X is equal to zero, and then I just have a beam that hasn't moved at all. So there's no deflection in the beam, it's just being axially compressed. And that's one possible solution to this um, ODE. But there's an interesting solution where this inside of the sine term is zero. So the interesting solution now, interesting, is when that sine of square root of P over E I L is equal to zero, which means that my square root of P over E I L is equal to uh, zero pi, two pi, just some N pi. So this is zero pi, two pi, kind of all the way to some n pi. So I can rearrange this equation and say my p for that interesting solution is equal to n squared pi squared e i e i e i over l squared. And I can say this is that critical load where I will get some snapping into a new unstable state. Now, the question is, what n do we end up with? So, does anyone have any guesses as to what n we might end up with for a, a free beam? Probably one. Which would be a half sine shape, which is the same buckled shape that I have now drawn, I don't know, 15 times. Um, yeah, so the that general solution, the, the, what, what we end up saying is, is when n equals 1, we hit a, a lowest energy solution. So now this p critical, so I can say the lowest energy solution is when my n is equal to 1, and then my p critical is just pi squared e i over l squared, which we've ended up back at that Euler Bernoulli solution for a pinned pinned beam. And so this is basically saying now, in that pinned configuration, let's draw this thing, the actual shape that this takes on uh, da, 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 is just a half sine shape. And the, we can figure out uh, the actual deflection of it if we start looking at what the, what the deflection equation is for this beam. Uh, which for, uh, I, I did a similar analysis in the beam bending lab um, for a fixed fixed column, uh, where you, you end up with a similar type ODE and you end up with a slightly different solution. But 
uh, in there. I think I actually show what the W, the NW equation is, but it depends on what your, your final moment is. So now I have another question um, that I, uh, I probably could have made as a poll everywhere. When might this N not be equal to one? Well, first, first let's see what N looks like for other solutions other than one. So if I say N is equal to one, I just have that half sine buckled shape if I say n is equal to 2, then this is now a sine n equals 2. If I say n is equal to 3, then I have something like that, some n equals 3. And I could keep going for kind of some arbitrarily complex buckled shape that is large. So I just kind of get a, a squiggly line at the end. Um, so if, if this is our lowest energy solution for, for being in air, when, when might that n be greater than 1? More than one bifurcation state. What are you thinking of with that? A different n condition. Right. So uh, yes, but I, I'm asking specifically for this pin pin. Oh. And you could have a constraint in the middle. Mm -hmm. so yeah. So if there's some other external constraint, so it, it turns out that these higher order solutions, laptops. Um, it turns out that these higher order solutions do show up um, sometimes, particularly for fiber composites. So this is now a uh, carbon fiber epoxy composite that you can see the, the fiber going through the middle there. And you can see now it's taken on this sinusoidally buckled shape, but it's not just that n equals one solution. And that's because if it were to take on just that, that one buckled mode, you're actually elastically deforming all of the surrounding material. So energetically, if it's, if it's in air, the lowest energy is that, just that half sign. But if you have some other stuff around here, you don't want to push on that stuff a lot because then that creates a strain energy inside the surrounding material. So what it does instead is it preferentially takes on these sinusoidal buckled shapes. Um, this is, uh, it's a possible failure mechanism for fiber composites. Most of the time that localizes to a, to a shear band and you really have to have kind of an isolated fiber like this where you see there's no other fibers around. Otherwise you start getting interactions happening between them and it's a whole complicated thing. Uh, but it is interesting that you do see some of this higher order buckling experimentally. Um, yeah, so that's where you would see n is greater than one. Um, you would just have to have some sort of confinement. Cool. Uh, thoughts, questions on that? So next I'm going to jump into the, the full general solution for how we get the beam buckled shape for an arbitrary um, for an arbitrary beam and condition. Okay. Yeah. How did I know for the ODE that the roots would be real? Yeah. Uh, I guess they is imaginary our imaginary roots solution to this one. Maybe. Yeah. Wait. Instead of repeated, you mean instead of a sine and a cosine? Or? Uh, <laughs> it's, so, well, I, I know because I had done the analysis of this thing a long time ago, and now I 
can't remember other possible solutions to uh, an ODE of this form off the top of my head. There are probably other solutions. Technically, this is a complex solution. If you have um, e to the i x, then e to the i x becomes a cosine of I, I, cosine plus i sine. Um, but yeah, let's let's not get into to ODEs too much. Just just take it for granted that that's a solution to the ODE. <laughs> Um, okay, so now I, I want to look at the general buckled solution. So at the beginning, or the beginning, last Friday? No, last Wednesday, uh, I gave you the, the Euler buckling equation that was pi squared di over kl squared, which now I'm going to go through the analysis to show where that actually comes from. So let's look at the general buckled solution. So for this, I'm going to have some beam uh, that has some load applied to it with then some unknown boundary conditions here at the end. Uh, and I'm applying some force P to that beam. And I, I'm going to say it could take on some buckled or some deflected shape. Um, so it, it can have some deflection away from its neutral axis. So. Uh, from our coordinate system x, z, which I guess I could center here at that point, I'm going to have some deflection w away, some deflection w of x away from my neutral plane. And what I want to do is figure out now for a combined axial and bending state, I want to try to try to come up with that uh, a solution to that general ODE. So what I have is my thing keeps switching over is dot can is, is strange. Okay, there we go. Uh, so what I have for this kind of we, we can go through a similar type of analysis to what we had done for this one, a force and a moment balance on this system, uh, throw in some uh, throw in some general relationships for our beam and bending, and we can come up back to that uh, general solution for our, our beam buckled equation. So we have EI d squared w dx squared. So you remember that this term now equal, set equal to zero was our, our general beam buckled state. Now I'm going to have an extra term here that is d uh, x squared of pw is equal to zero. So now I have our beam clink, our beam bending, bending, and our axial loading term. So if I don't have any axial load in this, then I. I would be solving my beam bending equation and getting a general deflection for a bent beam. And when I have an axial load now, the way that axial load contributes, we can again go through that force moment analysis um, and say that this adds basically an extra term to this fourth order ODE. Most of the time, uh, we assume that our EI and our P are constant across the beam. So we have a constant uh, a constant Young's modulus and area and load, so we can simplify it a little bit to say that this is EI. Uh, I'm going to just do to the fourth of x plus PW double prime of x is equal to zero, where uh, this is also D fourth DX to the fourth. And I'm just kind of using those interchangeably. So now, if I were to solve this general ODE, <coughs> I have some of the same terms, which I'm just going to tell you the answer for this thing again. I have some of the general terms that I had for the other one. So the, the general solution is W of x 
is C1 cosine of square root of P over EI X and C2 sine of square root of P over EI X but then because it's a fourth order I also have a C3 X and a C4 term here that come into the mix um, and so now this is the full general solution to a buckled beam so I, I or the, the deflection of a beam uh, that has been buckled with some axial load P so <clears throat> now if I want to solve this what I have to know is what my end conditions are so the same way as for the pin pin condition pin pin case we had W is 0 at 0 and W is L at 0 now I want for I'm going to show you boundary conditions for the the four different cases we had been looking at fixed fixed pin pinned um, fixed pinned and fixed free and so for that <coughs> uh, <coughs> All right. So for that, we have <coughs> our different boundary conditions. Let's say boundary conditions. And I can say for a pinned 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 beam, I know the deflection at zero uh, and the deflection at L are both equal to zero, and I know the moment at zero and the moment at L are both equal to zero because I have a free a free pivot there at the end, so it can't sustain any any bending moment at the end point. For a pinned pinned, or uh, sorry, for a fixed fixed. Fixed, fixed. I have still that W at zero and W at L are zero, uh, but now I have the deflection at the end and the deflection at L at, at zero and the deflection at L are zero. So this is. Uh, let me actually draw out what these look like. So this is just as a reminder. Pinned, pinned. And fixed, fixed, uh, fixed pinned roller thing, fixed pinned, uh, and then fixed free. So these are the four that I'm going to be looking at: uh, pinned, pin, fixed, fixed, uh, fixed pinned, and fixed free. So now for my fixed pinned, I have some combination of those two. So I, I still know the deflection at zero and the deflection at L are equal to zero, but then the angle at zero is zero and the moment at L is zero. Then for a fixed free, fixed, Free, I know the deflection at zero is zero, but then the deflection at L is some amount of deflection, some fixed delta. The angle at zero is zero, and then the moment at the end condition again is zero. Um, so for each of these, I'd given you some coefficients or some some k's, some effective lengths for these conditions, k is 1, k equals 0 0.5, k equals, um, or is approximately equal to 0 0.699, and then k is equal to 2. So what I want to do is go through this fixed pinned condition to show you, this is this is kind of the weirdest one, or with the, the strangest mix of boundary conditions. So I want to go through that analysis to show you how we actually end up with a solution to that. Let's, let's make sure I'm still fine on time. Cool. So for this now, what I'm going to do is take that general solution. So now I, I want to look at an example. 
solution for my fixed pin. And for that, I'm going to take these boundary conditions that I just defined above, uh, and then I'm going to take this general solution to the ODE and start plugging in those different boundary conditions and seeing what I get. So um, for just to make our analysis a little bit easier, uh, I'm going to say W at X is, um, what is that, sine square root of P E I C1 sine P E I X uh, minus the square root P E I uh, C2 cosine of E I X plus C3 and then W double prime of X I have uh, negative P E I C1 cosine of the thing and then minus P E I C2 sine of the thing. Um, this relationships to plug back into things. So the now if I if I want to solve that fixed pin condition I can say my boundary condition First, W at zero. W at zero goes to um, D2, or let's make sure I have the right things here. Uh, nope, C1. Yeah. C1 plus C4, because I have cosine of zero uh, is one, sine of zero, uh, C3 times zero. My W at L, I get something a little bit longer and more complicated, um, but here I have C1 cosine of P E I L C2 sine. Yeah. Uh, could you quickly go back to your W prime equation? Just yes. It should be. Yep. I totally remember how to take derivatives. I promise. Yeah. Thanks. Um, here, C2 sine P E I L C3 L C4 W prime at zero. This is now equal to zero. This is zero. W prime at zero is that uh, C2 now. So square root of P over E I C2 plus C3. Um, and then I know my moment at L is zero, which is uh, W double prime at L. I guess technically there's a there's a 1 over EI in here, over EI is equal to 0. So this is, um, I guess because it's 0, I can still write it out the same way. Uh, negative P over EI C1 cosine of square root of P EI L uh, minus P over E I C two sine P over E I L. There we go. So I could cancel these things out because um, that's all equal to zero, and say this is just C one two C one cosine plus C two sine is equal to zero. Um, so now, if I wanted to try to solve all of this, this is now one big, long, ugly system of equations. So what I'm going to do, instead of trying to solve these out individually, is reorganize this all into a matrix. So I'm going to say now, oof, some matrix 
times my C1, C2, C3, and C4 is equal to just zeros here. And I can plug all of these different coefficients in. So I can say for my first boundary condition, uh, C1 and C4 are equal to zero. For my second boundary condition, I have now cosine of that thing inside L uh, sine of that thing and then L and then 1. For my third boundary condition I have uh, 0 P E I and then 1 and 0 and this last one I have uh, negative P E I or I guess this is all positive uh, I can still just say um, the cosine of the thing and the sine of the thing and zeros are equal to zero. So, solving this system of equations, um, there's a few different ways to do this. So, one, I can say that the there's a trivial solution again where all of the constants are zero. So that means I have no deflection at all, and I just have uniaxial, uniaxial compression of my beam. But there's a more interesting solution, again, where all of this stuff is equal to zero. So, or not this stuff, but now specifically the determinant of all of this stuff is equal to zero. So I, if I call this an A matrix, I want to find the solution where the determinant of that A is equal to zero. And so, I can multiply all this out, taking the determinant of a four by four matrix is kind of gross, so I'm not actually gonna show you the analysis for it. Um, but what we end up with when we take that determinant is we have um, that A equals zero turns into uh, square root of P over EI, L is equal to tangent of square root of P over EI L. So all of those sines and cosines and square roots all end up uh, mashing into this equation. And this is the equation now that we're solving for um, effectively uh, X is equal to tan X. So there's a solution to X equals tan X um, that you have to solve numerically because it's not an easy one to figure out. But what we end up with if we solve x equals tan x uh, is for that lowest energy solution, that, that single buckled solution, we end up with our p critical is equal to 20.19 e i over l squared, um, which I can then rewrite using uh, a pi here, so I can pull a, or a pi squared, I can pull a pi squared out of that, e i over l squared, and then the term that's left here on the bottom is like a 0 0.699 there, or sorry, 0 0.699 uh, squared. So the way that I end up with that weird solution to the fixed pin condition, so that that k is 0 0.699 is I take the general solution to my ODE so that general solution here to this ODE I plug in all of my boundary conditions which are these uh, which are these ones uh, I set up then a system of equations that I can solve the determinant for and I end up with uh, a single equation that I can solve to figure out what that P over E I L R, or what that P over P over E I square root times L is, uh, and then I reorganize it into that same Euler buckling equation form that I liked before because I had I still want to compare it to my pin pin solution, and I end up with that K is equal to zero point six nine nine, or nine nine, which is actually equal to one over the square root of 2.046 or approximately 1 over the square root of 2.
So that's kind of the end. This, this is how all of this beam buckling analysis works. And what it is at the end of the day um, is we have a competition between beam bending and axial loading. And you can set up that beam bending ODE, this axial loading ODE, uh, and solve them simultaneously to figure out when that instability, when that snapping between them is going to happen. So that's how all of these beam buckling solutions come about. It's all an instability that you figure out through solving an ODE. Um, fun. I know, that analysis is a, little, is a little bit tedious, but I still felt like it was a useful one to see. Um, in practice, you, don't, you won't actually need to know how to go through that. What you need to know for exams is what the, the general Euler solution, pi squared EI over KL squared, and what each of these different boundary conditions are, <coughs> what the different coefficients are for each of these different boundary conditions. But I did think it was important to show why those equations are what they are instead of just giving them to you. Cool. So I think that's all that I had for today. We still have like five minutes left. Um, on Friday, we'll go through the recitation for beam bending. Um, and then I'll start getting into stress concentrations. So next week, the lab is DIC, digital image correlation, which will be looking at the stress concentrations around a plate in, or a hole, a plate with a hole in it. Um, so DIC is a really useful and interesting technique that I, I think you'll be able to learn a lot from and you get to see some cool stuff. So. Uh, any questions before we head out? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you all on Friday. Are you joining us?